Hello, everyone, and welcome to Bunker Hill Mining's live event hosted by SIX. I'm pleased to introduce the speakers for today. We're joined with Sam Ash, CEO, Richard Williams, Executive Chairman, and Mark Crowder, Chief Geologist of Bunker Hill Mining. Uh, this presentation will be focusing on the opportunity for investors to gain insight into the company's plan to deliver more shareholder value through exploration. We encourage you to ask questions in the chat in the bottom right corner of your screen. And there's no need to wait to the Q&A session at the end to post your questions. Please feel free to submit them as they come uh, to mind. This event is being recorded and will be available in the coming days as well. So without further ado, I'll pass things over to Sam to kick things off. Thank you very much and, and welcome everybody. This is a pretty exciting presentation for us today. Uh, as you all know, and people who have been following us, we've talked um, the, the last few of these events about how the prog project is progressing. Uh, I'd like to say that, uh, you know, just as a lead in, things are still going very, very well. We're advancing on schedule and on budget. Um, and with that in mind, as we look forward to 2024, one of the things that we're really focused on as a company is beginning to take positive and definitive steps towards unlocking the upside potential of what we see as a world-class asset in Bunker Hill. And uh, our strategy is really three-pronged, uh, focusing on resource conversion, near mine exploration, and also some very exciting new target exploration in our larger claim package. And just for a, a, you know, a bit of reference, our mineral inventory includes not only 7 million tons of measured and indicated mineralization, uh, but another 6.9 million tons of inferred mineralization. And uh, really, you know, this inferred mineralization uh, needs, uh, you know, a very modest amount of work to begin the resource conversion process. Uh, there's no, no inferred mineralization in our pre-feasibility mine plan, which is about five years. And we expect when we look at the quality of the inferred mineralization that uh, we'll have a uh, conservatively a conversion rate of 75% plus. That gives us a potential to double the mine life and, and uh, more than double the, uh, the uh, ongoing value that's indicated in the pre-feasibility with a very low risk, high reward um, and low cost uh, uh, conversion drilling program. And uh, Mark Crowder is going to talk a bit about more about that. Uh, but we also have near mine exploration. And, and this is, uh, you know, very uh, high quality exploration targets that is in close proximity to the existing mine workings and areas throughout the entire footprint of the mine that have a high potential for uh, new discoveries and um, an expansion of existing mineralization. It's important to remember that uh, the deposit is open in all directions along strike and at depth. Uh, in particular at depth, we, we see an opportunity to bring more silver and become a more silver focused uh, resource base. And uh, there's some really exciting opportunities uh, right on our doorstep uh, within easy access of existing underground workings. And potentially the biggest opportunity for us a real game-changing opportunity is new target exploration. Uh, our claim package is quite extensive. Uh, our, the existing mine footprint only represents about a third of the entire claim package that uh, we can that we control. Uh, we've done some geophysics uh, work that we've talked about before, and we are looking to uh, follow up, uh, identify targets, and begin the work of what we hope will be a, a game-changing discovery uh, in close proximity, but entirely separate from the historic uh, mine footprint. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Mark Crowder, who's our uh, chief geologist, has recently joined the team, uh, to run through the, that threefold strategy in a bit more detail. So, Mark? Thank you, Sam. Um, as you mentioned, I'm a chief geologist here. I just joined the team. I've got extensive experience in this district with both the Sunshine Mine and the Lucky Friday Mine. So it's been an exciting change to jump over here to the Bunker Hill and uh, continue to expand and improve this resource. So on the resource conversion, we've got three different areas that we believe that are really, really good opportunities for us to expand our resource conversion. So on the upper part, we've got a place called the Gap. 
New Guard Gap. It's up in an upper reaches of our mine. It's very reachable from current development, a little bit of drilling, and we can do some conversion. About a million tons is available to convert over to M&I, which is exciting that we already have places to drill those uh, locations. Also in that same neighborhood is a fold definition. We're in a fold belt here, and the fold has very minimal definition on the edges. There's an opportunity there to expand it a little bit. And again, we're, they're short holes. They're very easy to get at. We have existing development in the area. So it's a place that we would like to start and uh, get uh, expanding our resource and converting about 5 million tons over to M&I. And finally, in the New Garden area, there's an opportunity. This is beyond any existing drilling. Um, the area that we're uh, talking about over there on the right-hand side is uh, an area that has a great opportunity to see another uh, little bit of like a little finger out there of mineralization. It's beyond the existing resource. And so it will fully expand this New Guard area to a a uh, great deposit. And all of this stuff is above the water table. So we're not dealing with any major water pumping. We're not dealing with uh, any major development because this is already an existing working areas. They, they are readily available to us today. So it's a very low cost, low risk and very near term opportunity. It's accessible by all the existing development. And finally, there's Six million tons of uh, MNI. There, this is part of the the MNI conversion that Sam was previously talking about. That is very readily available for us to go and do very quickly this year. Then on the resource expansion side, this is a, a look, a little longer term look, looking at uh, the whole entire deposit. There's an area up there in the upper area that we've got. We've kind of got three areas. We've got an upper country area, a mid zone and a down deep area. The upper country are multiple high grade silver targets above the water table. We have existing drill platforms that can be reestablished with minimal rehabilitation. So that's to get us the air, power and water needed to set up proper drill stations so we can continue to drill out this resource in the upper area. In the mid zone, these are down dip extensions of the existing ore bodies. So these are just places where the uh, mining stopped in the past and we can restart in that. And all these areas are the kind of that middle band in this uh, picture. And they're at or just below the current water table. So it's not gonna take a whole lot to get access to this area. And the middle zone is a mixture of silver, lead and zinc. And each of those are really big bulk mineable areas. So we're looking at uh, long hole stoping as one of our primary methods. These are big bulk deposits. So it'd be, we'll be able to mine it in a low cost manner. And finally, the down, down deep areas. These are extensions that are all open at depth and open in all directions. And generally, as we move down in this deposit, we see higher grade silver and lead with depth. As the drill platforms become available, these targets will be uh, are predicted to be drilled. So kind of the takeaways, um, this is a hundred year old mine and it probably has another at least 50 to a hundred years left in it. So the potential to increase the silver as we go deep and we'll be using new modern, modern exploration technology, new drilling, new geophysics. These are the kind of technologies that we're bringing to the to the forefront so that we can be very successful in our exploration. And then finally, the, the big game changer is a geophysics. We've got 1200 acres of unexplored, untested near surface drill targets. These are to the south of our current uh, mining operation. And we've got two of them that we really are excited about. One of them is the government gulch target. This is a Similar orientation to the Quill New Guard zone. It's on two major structures in the area, has a seven to 10 million ton potential. So it's a huge large scale deposit potential down to the south of us. The second one that we're excited about is the Midland target zone, a little bit closer to our current workings. This is a deeper target and it's uh, 
pretty uh, neat to see that these geophysics are coming back with some really good targets for us to go and uh, follow up on. And a little more detail on each of them. Uh, the Government Gulch, like I mentioned, center section of two major faults. It's the Government Gulch Fault and the Midland Fault. The mineralization appears to be at or near the uh, intersections of these faults. It's in St. Regis Court Sites. St. Regis is one of the favorable hosts for mineralization in this district and always has been. It's a very strong geophysical target signature. That's why it's nice and hot and red. Um, so it's a good idea that there might be some mineralization in that area that warrants further research and uh, investigation. The second one is also along a major fault, the Midland. This is a major east-west fault. It's in Rivette Court Sites, which is also a favorable host for mineralization, both here at the Bunker Hill and elsewhere in this district. It's a little bit deeper geophysics signature, which may be, mean that maybe the mineralization leached from the surface and redeposit itself in, a, in the Rivette, which is at a deeper location. Um, the takeaways, strong geophysical anomalies. There's some favorable geology and they're along major structures. And each of these have a potential to totally redefine what the Bunker Hill is all about, that we have a whole nether deposit really close and nearby us. Thank you, Mark. So when you when you take a step back, what, what is our strategy and what are you going to see us uh, do over the over 2024? Where Well, first of all, the resource conversion, you know, that's the, what, the way I would characterize that is, is that is really very low hanging fruit and uh, an opportunity exists for us. And we're going to be starting to drill in Q2 uh, through Q3. And uh, we expect that to result in a, a resource update. Uh, with significant resource conversion and uh, and a strong potential for resource expansion you know, by the end of the year. Uh, and then uh, that leads into the resource expansion, kind of the same timeline. A, a lot of that drilling uh, will be uh, both resource conversion and resource expansion you know, from the same drill locations, which is nice. And again, resulting in, uh, in uh, what we expect to be an updated resource in Q4. And then on the new target exploration, uh, Mark and the team have a little bit of uh, um, field work to do this this, um, this spring, followed by a little bit more interpretation to really make sure that you know the you know the first drill hole that we poke in there is targeted and targeted properly. Uh, but we're looking to be drilling in in Q3, and uh, and a successful year would see us having some drill results coming back late Q4, potentially early, potentially early in 2025. And, uh, you know, what does this mean from a value creation perspective? You know, so you can see here where we're sitting at our pre-feasibility study. Uh, and I circled and outlined, uh, you know, just the inferred conversion at, uh, you know, 75% conversion rate uh, it has enormous upside potential. Uh, and that's before you get to the resource expansion and exploration uh, opportunity. And we see that uh, ha as having an, a significant long-term value creating potential for us here at Bunker Hill. So it's a, it, it's a really exciting program that, that, we're, that, that we're embarking on. You know, we always knew that this day would come uh, and our focus up to this point has certainly be, been on project delivery, project financing, making sure that we're getting the Bunker Hill mine into production. But now, as we begin to turn the page and focus a little bit more on uh, exploration and, and value creation, this is really where you're going to see the, the Bunker Hill team and the Bunker Hill deposit begin to add significant value. And with that, uh, I'd open the floor to any questions. Great. Thank you so much, uh, Sam and Mark. We do have some questions in the audience, but just as a reminder for people that tuned in late, please feel free to submit them. Um, I, I guess I'll kick off with the uh, resource resource conversion section. So what I gathered was there's three zones, the gap, the fold, and I believe the opportunity zone, correct? Would you be punching holes in all three of those zones for the resource conversion? Um, Mark, do you want to take that? 
Yep. So coming back to that slide, yes, we would be looking a little bit in the gap zone, a lot in the fold definition, and maybe a little bit in opportunity. The fold definition area is where the bulk of that resource conversion is. So that's where we're going to start is get in our initial pass right there in the middle of that, do a few up high and then a few long. Excellent. Thank you. Rock in the audience is wondering, uh, do your existing permits cover the mining in the newly defined areas or will you need additional permits? Uh, it, it, it's a little bit early to, uh, I, and I assume you're talking about the, uh, I, I assume you're talking about the game changing geophysics opportunity. So it, it's early in the game, but what I can say is that Bunker Hill is on 100% private land, 100% patented mining claims. It's all considered a, a single operation. So although there may be some permitting required, ultimately, if there is, uh, you know, surface disturbance, um, we, we would, you can expect that that uh, permitting to be associated with actually building and constructing a mine to be, uh, you know, pretty straightforward um, and, uh, and not all, all that extensive. Uh, for drilling, um, no, there's no no permits required to begin the drilling or the geologic field work. Great, thank you. Our Walker from the audience is wondering, when is the last time the surrounding claim package was subject to concerted systematic exploration? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah I, I would I would say really never. And you know that might sound strange, uh, but when you think about it in context of an operation that operated for a hundred years continuously, uh, discovered by an outcrop on surface and then essentially mined uh, down dip and within the existing mine footprint. Uh, the mine always had five to 10 years worth of reserves in front of it. Um, and because of that, you know, the uh, value proposition simply wasn't there for significant exploration activity across the larger claim package. Uh, you have to remember uh, that when the mine was in operation, it was vertically integrated. There was a lead smelter and a zinc plant. The mine was feeding that. And uh, and as long as, and it was operated as a vertically integrated business. So uh, the, the, the refining and smelting operations were really driving the strategy of the business. And uh, it didn't call for the uh, need to you know, really go and, and greatly expand the resource and maximize the resource area from a geologic perspective. Uh, because of that, inside the mine, you, you see the opportunities that uh, Mark outlined, particularly down dip. Bunker Hill is the shallowest mine in the Silver Valley. Uh, but uh, when you look at the exploration, uh, there's very few, if any, holes uh, below the bottom of the shaft level. And that's because they simply didn't need to uh, add resource uh, and the same holds true across the larger claim package. Uh, you know, there's um, certainly geologic mapping and we have a reasonable geologic understanding of what the claim package looks like, but it was never tested with, with, any, uh, with, with any drilling campaign and never really followed up and taken to that next step, which makes it one of the reasons that uh, Bunker Hill is such an exciting opportunity. If I just add a little bit more to the history too, and perhaps Sam, uh, I'll ask you a question on it, is that the ownership of the Bunker Hill mine and Sullivan and smelting operation uh, changed in 1968 uh, when Gulf Resources, an oil business out of Texas, uh, bought, the bought the business for a billion dollars on the uh, New York Stock Exchange in a hostile takeover. That, that was happening quite a lot in uh, American mining history at that time with energy businesses getting into hard rock mining. As you'd expect with the new owner, uh, they, did, they did a review of the mine's potential prior to purchase and then subsequent to purchase. And there was some systematic geological work done or survey work done uh, under that new ownership. And if I'm correct, Sam, the new guard um, uh, was discovered or, or certainly outlined for mining at that particular time. And, and also uh, they had a look, a much closer look uh, at the deeper silver that existed at that time. So the answer to the question, which is a, a, a corollary in addition to what uh, Sam said, uh, was when the new owners came in, 
before the mine subsequently shut, they did work, and that's given us a number of clues. But no one did geophysical work like uh, what the team has done at the moment on the surface there. Uh, and, and what it shows us, uh, those of us who are the new owners that came in, is that we're following on the work done by Gulf Resources team, but we're then applying new technology to the larger land package and discovering, which was really exciting uh, when we did this, that up in the upper areas of the mine, not just going all the way deep, which requires us to dewater the mine, which we will do, is a whole bunch of opportunities that Mark, uh, in particular here, uh, who we welcome to the team, uh, has really got his eyes on. Um, Sam, is that right in terms of the history? I may have got some of it a bit wrong, but um, that was, I think, uh, a time that they did invest in uh, in exploration or, or geological survey work. I, I would say you're correct, Richard. Uh, you know, your characterization, I think, is um, you know spot on. There was certainly, it's not like there was not geology work done. There was significant geology work done on the larger claim package. The but it was it never to the point where there was opportunities identified, but it was never uh, the next step was never taken to outline uh, exploration targets and, and follow up from a, a, a drilling perspective, and that's what's really exciting. So you're right, Richard. There's uh, you know there's uh, you know there's certainly some clues and, and some hints in, in the historic work that uh, you know we're we're leveraging. Uh, but, uh, you know, taking this next step is, is pretty exciting. Yeah. And the, I mean, again, for those of us who came to this and I, I, I keep on spinning around the history because it's really important. Um, not just the, the history of the rocks goes back a very long way, uh, but the history of the ownership and the activity is quite recent. Just think about it. You know, Gulf resources bought this in 68, 69, the environmental protection act comes in. 72 and 74, the, the Clean Air and Clean Water Acts. 73, the oil crisis that collapsed the world's economy. The new owners uh, didn't just have some geology to look at. They had some very, very significant external shocks to their business that led ultimately the combination of all of that and other factors to the closing of the mine in 1981. And then nothing happened with respect to this until what you're hearing now. And because of that understanding of the history, the human history on top of the geological history, that's what drew us to this mine. Not just the ability to get it into production quickly, the first to do so in a super fun site. But secondly, to be able to use modern techniques with the right team to unlock a whole bunch of potential that had been identified by those new owners, Gulf Resources back in the 70s, but never been able to take uh, in, into a, a mineable uh, economic position. And that's what we're here to show you today, as well as introduce you uh, to Mark, who is going to be leading the team to do this. So again, I double down. When people say, why did we come to Bunker? Not just because of the short-term production, but because of its very, very serious, large, considerable, and valuable potential. Uh, and I hope uh, at the risk of repeating myself that that is what people are taking away from the call. So the question was a very good one and I appreciate it. I'm gonna hand that back to Six, thank you. Well, thank you, Richard. And that leads into a good question in the audience. You just explained why your team chose this mine and this property specifically, but an individual is wondering why Mark joined the Bunker Hill team. So maybe you can elaborate further on, on your decision to jump on the team. Absolutely. I think the biggest reason why I jumped on this team was because of the people running this team. I've enjoyed working with them, several of them in past lives and past places, and we're all in the same place at the right time at the right mine right now. So it's a, a exciting time to work with people that I enjoy working with, and it's also exciting to be in a project that is getting it back up off the ground. And frankly, it's been underexplored and underappreciated in this district. And so I'm excited to bring this place back to life. That is why I joined this, this team. Excellent, thank you, Mark. And since we have um, you on, Chief Ge Geologist, I, I did write down revet quart quartzites. Uh, I was wondering if you could elaborate that for non-geological folk like me. Uh, what's the significance of this? Could you see higher concentrations of a specific metal in these types of rock? 
Absolutely. So there's two rock types actually here in the district that host 90% of the uh, ore bodies. Or it's the Rivet Quartzite, which is a quartzite in a old sedimentary package that got heated up a little bit and then it became a quartzite. And the other one is the St. Regis quartzite. So these two quartzite units hosted in a old layered sedimentary package uh, host most of the deposits in this area. There are a few other deposits and a few other different uh, lithologies, but whenever you see St. Regis and Revet quartzites and the Coeur d'Alene district, that's when you should start paying attention as uh, those are the places where you find mineralization for both silver, lead, and zinc. Thank you, Mark. Mike was wondering in the audience if you could elaborate a bit more on the estimated drilling costs. So the estimated cost of the drill programs, we're looking at anywhere from $50 to $100 a foot, depending on what size of core we're going to drill. We're, we're planning on drilling mostly NQ with a little HQ here and there. So it, it, dep it varies based on the drill hole size, but between $50 and $100 per foot is what we're looking at. Thank you. And a fitting follow-up question is posed by Rock here. Once you are in production, do you expect that the cash flows will be enough to continue the exploration or will you need to uh, go to market again? Uh, look, the, the, that's why we've pushed so quickly to get the mine into production and generating cash flow. Because we see that, uh, you know, that the most efficient um, investment and value creation potential from a shareholder's perspective is to fund the exploration out of free cash flow. If you think about it like a uh, like like an engine, it becomes a kind of a uh, self reinforcing cycle where we generate cash flow. We take a portion of that cash flow, we invest it into exploration, and the return on that exploration generates uh, additional cash flow, and it creates a uh, virtuous cycle of uh, value creation. So the simple answer to your question is yes, when we're in production, uh, exploration is to be fully funded out of uh, free cash flow. Thank you. Uh, another individual is wondering if mining will occur in Q4 this year. Uh, we are certainly on track for uh, mining and production in Q4. Perfect. Well, gentlemen, uh, that's all I see from the Q&A chat for today. A lot of good questions here. Uh, if you did come in a little late, just note that this is being recorded, so you can watch it, the replay available on YouTube probably within the day. If not, we will most certainly have it up tomorrow. Uh, any closing remarks from you, gentlemen, before we close things off here? Uh, just for myself, thank you all for turning in, and uh, thank you for the excellent questions. Um, it, it, this is a very exciting program, and this is a, a day that we've been working for is to really get to the point where we can talk about and action the value creating opportunity and potential that we see at Bunker Hill and what drew us uh, as a management team to the Bunker Hill project. Yeah, I'll, I'll, um, Mark, have you got anything to say? Because I'll say a thing at the end. I just want to thank for everybody for tuning in because this is an exciting time for the Bunker Hill. Good. And uh, for everybody dialing in, um, you're all going to get to hear a lot more of Mark and his uh, uh, important work as we go on. Um, many people look from the outside into Bunker Hill, um, perhaps looking for investment opportunities, and they go, well, it's a, a little bit small. Uh, what we've hopefully shown today is we're making uh, a mine uh, that will then unlock a much larger mine. Uh, and so for those equity holders participating today um, or those that have participated in the past, what that is is a ticket to scale. And this slide shows that. All miners, uh, exploration, finances, investors know that those things take time and one needs to be exceedingly thoughtful uh, and patient uh, about the accurate delivery of decent results. And I hope that the impression that we've created here is of measured, considered, thoughtful exploration, not rushing the gate. Uh, and uh, Mr. Krautis' um, style here, I hope has emphasized that. 
That's exceedingly important. This chart shows it. The second piece is as we go into production, um, every mine uh, is different. Um, and in the Silver Valley, uh, we are blessed with the fact that we're able to use long haul open stoping with base backfill, what Mark referred to as bulk mining methods, given the nature of certain ore bodies as he referred to them uh, earlier on. That is not the same with every other mine in the Silver Valley. And it's the one of the things that ensures that our operating costs will be in the lower quartile uh, of that zinc lead silver um, uh, industry comparison. Because we've got fixed infrastructure in place, we've got good access to the um, mineable areas and we can use uh, bulk operations. So we're not just looking at geology for geology's sake, expanded resources. We're looking at low cost, high margin reserves. And that's the way in which we're uh, working the development of this mine over obviously this year, but many, many years to come. Uh, and so thank you very much for the call. Uh, I've really enjoyed, I've really wanted this call to happen for a long time to explain the geology, but we wanted to wait until we got Mark with his hands around it, uh, his brain into it, and his team really um, ready to go. So thank you, Sam. Thank you, Mark. Mark, you did an outstanding job. And thank you for everybody else who's been on the call. And as always, Six, um, great job. Thank you. And thank you. Uh, we look forward to seeing more Mark. Thank you, Mark. And Sam and Richard, uh, hopefully AME Roundup goes well. So thank you all and enjoy the rest of your day.